right, well, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, as we continue this journey called The Movement. Basically, what we're doing right now is we're walking through the book of Acts together. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, just lift up a hand, and we will get you a copy of God's Word as some of our Connect teams walking down the aisles. Um, If you don't own a copy of God's Word, please take this home as a gift from our church to you. There's nothing greater that you can do than to open up the Word of God and read it and apply it in your life. Um, It's really important for you to understand if you are a first time guest with us, what's been going on in the passage, in the passages that we've been looking at before this um, in Acts chapter three, because in Acts chapter four, it's all about basically what happened in Acts chapter three. And in Acts chapter three, after Pentecost and Acts chapter two, Peter and John filled with the Holy Spirit are going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. And basically they walk up and they, come in contact with a crippled man, a man who had been crippled from birth. And uh, this crippled man asked for money, and they say, we don't have any money, but what we do have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And instantly, this man's ankles and his feet became strong, and he got up and walked. It's incredible. So we saw that two weeks ago. We talked about healing. And then last week, we talked about the opportunity that Peter rose up. We said that when Jesus performs a miracle like that, some things happen, right? Some hype starts to build. Um, If we saw that happen in the the city of New Orleans, like some crowds would begin to gather larger than anything that we could find with Mardi Gras. And so crowds started to gather around saying, "What, what in the world is going on? We've known this guy. We've seen this guy beg his entire life. He's 40 plus years of age. Now all of a sudden, how come he's dunking on dudes in the AAU tournament, right? Like what's going on here? So Peter stands up in this opportunity and he explains the gospel and he explains all the intricacies of the gospel. So that was the week before. Now we're jumping into a place in Acts chapter four where some things begin to really happen. I shared this with you last week that at the core we're gonna find some really important things about not just what happened back in the day when the movement began to launch, but what we need to expect today as well. And when we study the book of Acts, we need to look at it in a descriptive way. So what I mean by that is we look at some of those things and we say, okay, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna happen the same way for us. Different places, different times, God does whatever God wants to do. We just go on the ride. He's God, we're not. We submit to that. But we can look at some of these things in a prescriptive way. So we can look at it and say, okay, now we're gonna see as a result of God doing something unbelievable, healing this crippled man, of Peter faithfully standing up to explain the gospel and then continuing to proclaim the name of Jesus as some resistance starts to show up. Uh, there's just this reality, guys, that it's getting harder and harder to stand up for Jesus. Like, in all reality, it's getting harder and harder to stand up for Jesus. That day is coming to a very, very quick end in America. You might say, no, it's not. Well, I'd, I'd first of all say those who say it's not, I don't think they're fully explaining who Jesus is. Like there's the Jesus that America has created that's just tolerant of all things, that's okay with what you wanna do, what this person wants to do, that just loves, 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 loves. And then there's the Jesus of the Bible. And the Jesus of the Bible does love, 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 but he's also extremely, extremely exclusive. Talks a lot about responsibility. Talks a lot about judgment. Talks a lot about hell. Hell's real, Jesus talked about it. And what I want you to know is that if we truly rise up as the church, as Vintage Church, I've shared with you over and over, the lead pastor, my name's Rob Wilden, nice to meet you, kind of going on this beard thing right now, enjoying gumbo for weeks on end after you eat it, it's awesome. Um, But like, we, we started this church thing like five years ago, six years ago, and we don't really know what we're doing, we're having a lot of fun trying to figure it out, but we fail We really do, we fail if all you guys talk about all week long is Vintage Church. Like we want you talking about Jesus. Because this is all about Jesus. This church was started for Jesus. It's not a bunch of people. 
just kind of doing some sort of club thing in the heart of New Orleans. There's enough clubs, there's enough parties going on. We're here worshiping Jesus. And y'all just love that time of worship that Pastor Robert and our band led us in. Can we thank God for our arts team? Like, they're just unbelievable. I want you to know, these aren't performers up here. All week long at Rock and Bowl, you'll come here and you'll find performers. They're not performing up here. They're worship leaders. Because here, we're not really into what's in it for us. We're here worshiping Jesus. And if we truly rise up as the church in New Orleans and truly proclaim and exalt the name of Jesus, I'm gonna show you here some things that I guarantee are gonna happen in our lives. So y'all ready to walk through these? Let's look in Acts chapter four together. The first thing that I guarantee, here's the question. We're talking about proclamation or proclaiming the gospel. Last week, Peter kind of explained the gospel. Now he proclaims the gospel And here's the question I pose for you. What happens when you proclaim Jesus? Number one is this, persecution. Persecution. Let's check it. Acts chapter four, verse one through three says this. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. So let's remind ourselves what's going on. Peter is explaining the gospel. He's explaining that, look, this man is walking around dunking on dudes because of Jesus. It's the only explanation. It's the power of Christ. The power of Christ brings all these things into the world. So as they were speaking to the people, they don't stop. It wasn't something like, oh, it's Sunday, so let's be Christian robots, and now we can go back Monday through Saturday and do whatever we want to. Non-stop, proclaiming of the gospel. As they were speaking to the people, uh uh-oh, look at it. Chairman of Deacon shows up. All the church people show up. This is what's crazy, guys. You will find a lot of resistance from the world, but I've just found out, like, being a pastor for about five, six years, the nastiest stuff comes from the people that are in the church which makes me try and figure out whether or not they're actually in the church. Like, the biggest scars I've got in my life over the last six years didn't come from lost people in this city. It's come from people who know Jesus. People who are kind of religious. They wear the church clothes. They fake it on Sundays. And here they go. The priest, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, came upon them. And what does it say in verse 2? And they were so just thrilled and excited that Jesus had performed a miracle, they started praising Jesus. Is that what it says? It says they were greatly annoyed. I don't know why. Maybe it didn't happen in their building. Maybe no one's worshiping them. Maybe they lost Twitter followers because some started to follow Peter instead. I don't know what they're greatly annoyed about, but they're greatly annoyed. Ultimately, we know this. These priests and these kind of religious people are greatly annoyed because they're not followers of Jesus. Be very careful in New Orleans. Listen to me, all of y'all, listen to me, because there's a lot of new New Orleanians in this room. There's a lot of young people in this room. There are some wolves in sheep's clothing in New Orleans. that are hiding behind the veil of a church as a pastor, they don't know Jesus. Be careful. Here the religious people are annoyed. It explains why. It's legit right here. It says, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. How dare they? In verse three, what happens? I mean, there's a reality. I shared this last week, guys. Like, you know, let's just say, you know, me and Danny, our revolution leader, got our youth group up here. What's up? Yo. And and me and Danny are rolling through the streets of New Orleans, and God, by the Holy Spirit, leads us and empowers us to heal a crippled man who's been crippled from birth. Like, there's a reality, even in New Orleans today. Like, me and Danny, we're pretty popular dudes in this city. 
let's just say we're going to have to find another place to meet. With social media and everything else, like this won't be able to hold us anymore. There'll be people flocking from all over the place. So that's the reality of our day and age. It's still very, very popular to stand up for Jesus. I believe that day's fading and fading and fading and fading and fading. You're not going to be able to just kind of sit back and pick and choose a church because of your personal preference, because of your convenience. It's going to mean life or death. That's when movements really happen. But here in this place, these guys do this unbelievable thing. And what happens to them? It says in verse 3, And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. What happens when you proclaim Jesus? You will be persecuted. Persecution is inevitable. I have gone so far. It's not in scripture, but I can't find any other examples. That if you truly are living for Christ, and you're not experiencing any resistance from the enemy or from this world, I highly doubt you're doing anything of significance for Jesus. You're on the bench. You're not in the game. Like, it, it reminds me, thinking of that analogy of a time, my senior year in high school, you know, about 50 pounds ago, I played basketball. And... Uh, was kind of good up in South Carolina and got invited to a five-star basketball camp up at UNC Charlotte. It, it'll be forever known for me in my mind as the, the day that, that Carlos Boozer ruined my chance of playing at Duke University. Um, we, were, we were playing basketball and, and I got invited to be a part of one of the all-star teams at the end of the day. You play all day and then they pick an all-star. There was an all-star team at the end of the day and I'm playing with a, with a guy named Chris Wilcox. He played in the NBA and some other guys and then Carlos Boozer's on the other team and, and let's just say when the game started, I knocked down three threes. Like Coach K's in the building. There's all these scouts. I'm like, it's on. I hate Duke. I hate those Blue Devils. I'm a UNC Tar Heel but I will sign with you, Coach K. Let's do this. So I'm thinking, man, this is like mini Wojo. I'm in the next Wojo. It's happening. And then all of a sudden, one of my teammates throws this pass cross court. And I'm the only one back, and it's Boozer. Nine foot eight. <laughs> 755 pounds. He was the number one player in high school my senior year. And he goes, and there he goes down this way. I'm the only one back. I'm booking it. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? I can't jump with this sucker. I can't do it. He's going to slam it on me. I'm going to try and take a charge. Coach K likes charges. Shane Battier and all those guys, they charge, they flop like crazy, stupid blue devils. So I'm like, I'm going to take a charge and press Coach K. Three threes, a charge, I'm in. He's going to sign me. So I'm busting it and I come over there, big dummy. I trip over my feet. And it makes it look as if literally Boozer just hurtled me. And I'm falling. And there he goes over the top of me and boom, slam dunks it. That dadgum coach calls a timeout right after the dunk and takes me out of the game and I never get back in. Thank you. I should be in the stinking NBA right now. It wasn't for my daggum trip. Well, that camp, why am I talking about that camp? This is why I'm talking about that camp. Every night we would play spades. Every night we would play spades. Like we'd just be playing spades and stuff. I was a follower of Jesus back then, my senior year. We were at this camp. And, and I'll, I'll never forget, like, the conversation that was happening on this one night was just so vulgar. It was really, it was horrendous. And, and at one point, one of the guys, I don't even know who he was, he turns to me, he's like, you know, you're awfully quiet. What's your deal? And man, I chickened out. I'll never forget it. I myself, I was a believer fell away from being faithful to God. And I started cussing. I started joining in the conversation. 
to be cool. And I failed. I, I put this question, I'm, I'm trying to write in my, in my blog to serve you guys, robwilton.tv, and, and, and I, I'm trying to give you guys questions because we don't want the sermon to just be an event once a week. We want this to be holistic. We want this to be a lifestyle journey for you. So I'm trying every week, every Saturday, I'm gonna give you some questions to think about. I want you to actually go and read the passage of scripture that we're gonna be tackling on Sunday. And I want you to process some things before, then we're gonna actually be here. We're gonna dive into the word together. And then I want you to get into community groups to discuss this because we want this to be life. We don't want this to be, oh, I'm church, now I'm not. And, and one of the questions that I posed in my questions coming into this was this question. If it was illegal to proclaim Jesus, would there be enough evidence to throw you into jail? At that camp, not for me. I failed. What happens when you proclaim Jesus? Number one, persecution. Number two, I love this. Salvation. What happens when you proclaim Jesus? Salvation. Now, man cannot save. Only Jesus saves. But he has given us the privilege to go fishing. You and I have been given the privilege by Jesus to be fishers of men. And we are faithful like male men delivering a message that we didn't write, we didn't create. We're just delivering it. And they can either accept it or reject it. And we know that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is the one who saves. Some of you guys are here, you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. You're gonna hear me proclaim the gospel. You're gonna hear others proclaim the gospel. We're worshiping Jesus. We pray that the Holy Spirit would be faithful to bless what he has promised to always bless. Here's real prosperity gospel. The only thing that God has promised to bless, not your pocketbooks, not your health, Nothing else. It's this, the advancement of the kingdom of God. That's it. Some of you, he's going to bless that by killing you for the sake of Jesus. My father-in-law is dead today. I believe, and so did he, because one of our last few walks that we went on, right before he died, he told me, he said, Rob, I don't know why I'm going through suffering. I don't know why cancer might take me out, but I do know this. There's a lot of people right now praying. There's a lot of people seeking Jesus. There's a lot of people pointing to Jesus right now. And if my death means that a lot of people come to Jesus, my death is worth it. I want you to know that what happens when you proclaim Jesus? Salvation in verse four, check it. Freaking Billy Graham crusade happens. It's awesome. It says, but many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. You remember how many people got saved right after Acts chapter two, Peter's sermon? 3,000. Church has grown a little. They are now 5,000. The movement's happening. I had the privilege growing up as a kid, and I still have the privilege, my dad is Dr. Billy Graham's pastor, of seeing in our world some movements like this. There's some things happening where my brother is right now in Southeast Asia serving as a missionary. There are some movements that are happening with just an uncontrollable harvest of salvation. And I'm just telling you, y'all might think I'm stupid. I could care less. I just believe our city could experience the same thing. I want you to know when I get up to pray, I do not just pray, Lord Jesus, lead me to lead someone to Jesus today. I pray that and I believe that he could do that. Try to lead a dude in the steam room to Jesus the other day. It was his fault. He turned to me and said, man, this feels like hell. I said, I said, well, actually. So I started to share with him. All right, here, here's how you can avoid hell. So at least he knows now. So like I asked for the Lord to do that, but you know what I've been praying ever since we started Vintage? Lord Jesus, save every soul in this city. I believe Jesus loves every soul in this city. 
It says, but many who heard the word believed. Who in your life right now needs Jesus? I want you to know what happens when you proclaim Jesus. That's the first step for some of you. Just get in the game. Tell them about Jesus. How will they know if they don't hear? So tell them about Jesus and leave the results up to God. And as I've shared with you, remember, this is like since Pentecost. This is like Peter's fifth or sixth time he's sharing about Jesus. You might have to keep going back and keep going back and keep witnessing and keep witnessing and keep witnessing. Be faithful. Keep sharing the gospel. Believe that God is going to be faithful to what he has promised to be faithful to. The advancement of the kingdom, salvation. Jesus save every soul in New Orleans. Number three, defense. Defense. What happens when you proclaim the gospel? Number one, persecution. Number two, salvation. Number three, defense. Look what happens here with Peter and with John. It says in verse five, let me read all of this and then I want to break it down. In verse five, it says, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. So man, Peter and John go to jail. You know, this movement happens. Incredible. Tons of people are saved by the gospel of Jesus. Everybody's saying, oh snap, this thing's for real. These guys didn't even have a church service and sing just as I am, and people are still giving them li- their lives to Jesus. Like we threw these suckers in jail, and people were coming to faith in Jesus. So they can't ignore it. Like what, what's going on? Even these rulers that killed Jesus, that crucified Jesus, are now saying, whoa, 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 maybe we got this wrong. Maybe Jesus is legit. Maybe this is something that's real. So check out what happens. In verse six, with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who are of the high priestly family. They had robes on and everything. They're really important. Verse seven. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Sounds like a broken record player, right? In Acts. How many times does Peter get asked this? I've been, begin like, some of y'all might look at that and say, dang, like, where, give us another question. You know what I've been asking for? I've been asking as I've been hearing this question come to Peter over and over again, by what power or what name did you do this? I've been starting to ask the Lord, Lord, would you please bring someone to me to ask me how I'm living for Jesus? <laughs> how are you able to do this, Rob? Rob? I got people in my own neighborhood going through nasty divorces right now. Trying to love on my neighbors, different things like that. I pray, Rob, how how are you able to stay married to Annabeth? Well, let me just tell you, I am a dang good Casanova. You should hear my singing, my dates, the flowers. I write poetry. That ain't how me and Annabeth are still married. Annabeth and I are still trucking into our 10-year anniversary this May because of Jesus. By what power, what name did you do this? Jesus. Here they ask this question. It says, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. That's crucial. How is he filled with the Holy Spirit? He's saved. Some of you guys want to live for Jesus, but you can't live for Jesus without Jesus. So you got to give your life to Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then go. Because your only hope of doing anything of significant for Jesus is with Jesus. Because it's all about Jesus. So then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, remember Acts 3, by what means this man has been healed, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well or healed. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, in his defense of the gospel, let me share with you three aspects of his defense. These aren't in the notes. Pastor Dustin, I'm sorry. It came to me last night as I was studying. 
I didn't want to bog down our media time, all that kind of stuff. So write these down. These are really important. We'll put it up. We'll try and get them going because this is really important because you guys are going to be put in a place when you proclaim Jesus. It's not just so simple. Jesus! And everybody's like, oh, yeah, we'll worship Jesus. <laughs> like join one of our community groups. There's some awesome questions going on right now. You're going to have to analyze it, talk about it, dig into history, study context. You have to do all these different things. Find things in our culture and relate them to the gospel. In the defense of the gospel, here there's three simple things, and I've tried to make them all sound the same so you can remember them. Number one, exaltation. There is Jesus! By what power, what name did you do this? Jesus! Not Man, our band was off the hook. Man, this, 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 this. Peter proclaims, he exalts exaltation, Jesus. In your defense, there's always exaltation. Any person out there that's an apologist, okay, likes to defend the gospel and all that kind of stuff, that defends the gospel without saying the name of Jesus or proclaiming the name of Jesus, he's a cult leader. He ain't on my team. I don't care where you go in scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. It's gonna point to Jesus. We used to have a really smart guy on staff with us, had breakfast with him this past week. He said, every theophany is a Christophany. For those of you are like, huh? That's what I said the first time he said it. Everything in God's word points to Christ. So there's exaltation. Number two, though, there's explanation. There's explanation. What is said here in verse 11 is this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. So basically what he's doing, he's laying out some context. He's talking to these leaders of the temple who were responsible for building the temple. And what he's saying is, look, the same stone, the capstone, can be either the stone that keeps this whole thing going that keeps everything stable, or it can be the one that takes everything down. It says Jesus is the cornerstone. So to the believer, he's the one that keeps everything together, and to the one who's not a believer, he's the one that sends you to hell. Because if you deny the name of Jesus, he is the only way, the only truth, the only life. No one comes to the Father except through him. There's exaltation and there's explanation. And then number three, there's exclusivity. Sounds good, doesn't it, Dustin? Easy points to remember. Say those with me. Exaltation, explanation, exclusivity. Say that again. Exaltation, explanation, exclusivity. Why exclusivity? It says it right there in verse 12. What does it say? And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You cannot defend the gospel and end your conversation with this. Well, it's okay what you believe. There is no other name. And I'm sorry what your mama taught you, what your conviction is. I'm sorry this might hurt your feelings. I'm sorry culture isn't necessarily proclaiming that Jesus is the only way. But I want you to know there's exclusivity. Jesus is the only way. And I don't know exactly your journey. I'm sad that maybe someone in the church has caused you to run away from the church. I'm sad that you've had false representations. I'm sad that you've had bad theology. I'm sorry about all those things, but it does not change the reality that Jesus is the only way. Defense. Peter could have taught at a seminary. Lastly, There's persecution, salvation, defense. We close with this, movement. The movement. There is movement. All right, let's look at this. Let me read it real fast. Check out this movement. It says, now when they saw the 
boldness of Peter and John proclaiming the gospel of Jesus and perceived that they were uneducated common men. They were astonished. I told y'all that. If we really saw a movement of the Holy Spirit hit Vintage Church and we just saw thousands of people come to faith in Jesus, ain't nobody saying, dang, Rob is smart. (laughs) Y'all know me. I'm not. Right? Like everybody's saying, whoa, something else is happening. All those losers at Vintage Church are bringing something awesome into this world. There's no way that's Pastor Dustin. He's got a goatee now. There's no way. There's no way. It's all about Jesus. I said I wasn't going to break this down. Let's keep going. It says, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Man, that's good. Do people recognize you've been with Jesus? I could stop there and preach for six hours. Verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But then when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another. So it's like the huddle. Okay, how are we gonna finally get past the Seahawks defense? Like, because nobody can score on the Seahawks defense. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And and what ends up happening here, it says in verse 16, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we now cannot deny it. So these rulers, these leaders that had killed Jesus are now like, holy cow, this is for real. This is for real. Jesus is for real. We cannot deny it. We don't know what to do with it, but we cannot deny that Jesus is for real. Verse 17, but in order that it may spread no further among the people. So they can't deny it, but still they're against it. The enemy's dangerous. There's a lot of people that know Jesus, but don't know Jesus. So it clicked with them. That's why don't just go after Jesus with your head intellectually, it's a relationship we're after. So they know Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. And they're trying to prevent them from spreading it. Verse 18, so they called them and charged them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. I love this. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Basically, they said this, I am only accountable to God. We are called to honor people in our lives, honor government in our lives, honor authority in our lives, but at the end of the day, if it causes us to deny the faith, we better stay faithful to God. So what that means Me, your pastor, if it's illegal to preach Jesus, I'm going to jail. I already don't have a good resume as a pastor, for those of you who don't know. First church I ever pastored, I got kicked out of. Three months, they took it, like they kicked me out. One for one as a pastor, being kicked out of a church. Just add that on. Kicked out of church, jail. Perfect resume for the world to follow, right? Hmm, has he got a PhD too? Because that would just be a humdinger. This would be an awesome guy. Like there's this reality here that they say, we answer only to God. And then in verse 21, it says, and when they had further threatened them, they let them go. Finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. 40 years, couldn't walk, now he walks. It's the blind man that Jesus touched. He's like, what happened? Everybody's like, what happened to you? Look, I don't know what happened. I was blind, but now I see. Now I see. Basically, this movement of Jesus becomes uncontrollable. Why? Look with me in verse 21. It says this, because of of the people. Because of the people. 
filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, Vintage Church. Filled with the Holy Spirit. All people are called to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Filled with the Holy Spirit. All people are called to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. What does that mean? There were some blogs going out in in the Christian world. For those of you who aren't in that Christian world, don't sweat it. There's a lot of things happening in there that would really cause you to stay away from Jesus. In some of the circles that I hang with, there were some blogs out there talking about the significance of the church. What is the church? What does it look like? Do we really have to come to a church building on the weekends to truly be faithful to what God's called us to? I think that there were a lot of things on all sides of the spectrum that were very, very good for us to talk about. There's a reality that there's a lot of people that don't want to have anything to do with the church because they have so, people have so like made these things religion instead of relationship. And there's a good reason for us to combat that. But then there's the other side of it where I've told you this, I think it's the biggest hypocrisy for someone to judge the church that doesn't want to be judged by the church. For someone to come in and say, you know, the church didn't do this for me and this for me and I'm judged because they've got these boxes that I can't fit in and all that other kind of stuff. Meanwhile, you want someone to love you unconditionally. You keep forgetting the church is not perfect. We're not Jesus. We're just trying our best. As long as the church can be honest and open about that and not act perfect and say we're perfect, man, forgive them. So what does that mean for us when you ask these questions like, what is a community group? What is the church? Well, let me ask you the correlation of what Jesus brings out in scripture. He talks about the relationship between Christ and his church, similar to the relationship of a marriage. And and this is what I would just say. Yeah, there's some social things and there's some historical things that we do. No one back in the book of Acts was meeting at places like Rock and Bowl and they had to have Chris Tomlin worship and they had to do this. And you know, like nobody, that some of those things are, are simple, practical, semantic type of things, okay? I mean, the generation before me swears, okay, swears that the only way to worship Jesus was with an organ and a choir. As if God, by the Holy Spirit, came down like he did for the Mormons at a certain point in history, and provided them the only means by which we worship Jesus back in the 1950s. No, there's different people, groups, worshiping Jesus in a number of different ways everywhere. So let's understand something. When we talk about what is the church, what is community group, let's talk about a marriage. Some of you guys are doing this in terms of the marriage. First of all, you're loving Jesus but hating his wife. I'll just say this. We're not going to be friends if you come and tell me, Rob, I love you. I hate Annabeth. We're just not going to go that far. You'll probably be blocked on Facebook. And some of y'all are just saying, screw you. Well, in a marriage relationship, it would be like this. This is kind of, so the first step is you're not even giving it a chance. But secondly, what you're deciding to do is you're in the marriage relationship. You're deciding to say, well, I like this about a marriage. I like this about a marriage. And I like this about a marriage. I'll do those things. And all the other hard, sticky things, the difficult things, I'm not going to do. So I enjoy the sex. I enjoy the dates. I enjoy the vacations. I enjoy playing with my boys, not spanking my boys. And that's why I'm going to hang out. Wife, good luck. Everything else, the finances, all the struggles, the heartache, that's for you. Because I want to hang out where I want to hang out, which is the most fun part to hang out. The place that makes me feel just so awesome and fills me up with love. A true marriage, guys, engages not only the great elements that God has put in our lives of marriage, but also the difficult elements. 
And when we provide for you, nowhere in scripture does it say that we have to come here every week and do this. At Rock and Bowl. Nowhere in scripture, all these different things. But what are we trying to put yourself into this position of? The full body of Christ. That's why, guys, as a church, I'm just letting you know, I'm going a little bit longer than I should, but I need to share this with everybody because we're talking about it so much right now, and I'm going to try and save us some one-on-one -on -one meetings. We're trying to move as far away as we can from having exclusive groups just around people that look like you that are your same age. All girls groups, all guys groups. Now, we want those things to happen. We love our youth group. But revolution, don't just hang out here and that's it. That's why I love your front row and center right now. It is good. Some of you single guys, you need to hang out with a married couple. You're all theory. <laughs> that's all you are. You're just a theorist. And every one of your theories... <laughs> You think that this idea of marriage, I've taught with some of you dudes, y'all are just going to be holding hands and frolicking <laughs> through the fields together, and it's just going to be perfect. Y'all are never mad at each other. All this kind of, bull. Sometimes, once a year, Annabeth and I get to do this together. <laughs> but most of the time, we don't. It's real life stuff, guys. It's heartache, it's arguments, it's forgiveness. And we want our community groups, when we say we'd love for you to make this a priority on weekend and we'd love for you to make a community group each week a priority, we want you to still have an all guys accountability group, start a women's Bible study, but they will not substitute this or your community group. Why? Because in those settings, you're actually gonna find true accountability. A bunch of single women talking together about their issues is not the full picture of the church. We need each other. That's why some of you who are a little bit older at Vintage, I'm begging you to come and meet with one of us who are pastors. We have a ton of young married couples, younger people who are so hungry for some mentorship and love in their life right now. And right now, our pastoral team, Robert, how old are you, 36? He's our senior adult pastor. <laughs> Guys, we need some people who've gone in the game. My dad and I have such a sweet relationship now, but when I started a church five years ago, I was such an arrogant jerk to him. I was a theorist like you single guys. And I thought this and this and this because I'd read a few good books that this is what it means to be a pastor. And it took me being a pastor to realize I don't know what I'm doing. And I better surround myself by some wise people, some people who have lived a life, some people who have journeyed with Christ. Y'all get this? The movement happens, listen to me. The movement happens when we fully as the church go and be the church. And this is one thing what happened? Listen to me. This is what I've been praying for. I'm not wanting only the movement to happen here on Sundays at Rock and Bowl. What happened with Peter and John? Peter and John stood up at the end of Acts chapter 3. They proclaimed the gospel. Here they proclaimed the gospel in the Sanhedrin in front of all the religious leaders. So kind of in the temple. They're having church. They preach a sermon. But why does the movement continue to move forward? It says because of all the people. Not because of Peter and John standing up to preach the gospel. It's because everyone that heard took it back to their neighborhoods and now there's a movement they cannot control. They cannot control. All I want to do right here, like we're about to in just a few moments, Robert, you better come on and stand up or I'm going to preach till Mardi Gras. All I want to do right now is celebrate encourage, inspire, equip. I pray people get saved. I pray we have some unbelievable things happen, but this is not the only point. This is one expression of a marriage. Some of you, your step, join a community group. Some of you, a step, get out of that only exclusive group that you have, find one. We're no longer pushing people towards community groups of same ages, same likes, all that stuff. 
We would love for you to be in a group that has a diversity of race, a diversity of age, a diversity of neighborhood. Because it's good for you. It's good for me. I have not grown in my life when things have been so perfect and everyone around agrees with me. I've grown in my life when there's been some fire. When there's been someone that's older in my life that sat me down and said, Rob, you're a theorist. I'm praying for a movement, guys. Even this gathering, Robert's sitting there leading. He's got three songs planned. He pulls out how great is our God. We're trying to anticipate. We try and wear, you know, a heart on our sleeves. We're seeing, we're starting to run out of room. So we're anticipating we're going to need to have two gatherings here eventually. Why? Because I refuse to put a sign up at the entrance there telling people to go to hell. We don't have room for you. So we're going to make more and more room if we can here. But we don't own rock and bowl, so we got to stay within confined space. So it means that our gatherings might have to go an hour. You all know the challenge today was for me to preach for 25 minutes? <laughs> Woo! 25 minutes! Oh, I don't know if that's going to happen. So, like, we'll, we'll try and get together, and maybe I'll preach through both services and just keep going while people transition. One group gets the first half of the sermon, the other group gets the second half. We'll try and figure it out. Like, I don't know how to do this. I don't. Because as I stand up, I see your faces, and I feel the Holy Spirit leading me to communicate some things. You're starting to buy lies from the enemy. You're reading too many blogs. You're listening to mama more than Jesus. You're not plugging into community. You're buying the lies of Satan. And I'm just so desperate, guys. I really am. In the city of New Orleans, a place where no one would ever say, there is a place that's ready for a movement of God. I'm so ready in the city of New Orleans to see the Spirit of God come in and unleash a movement that even if the government came in and said, you cannot proclaim the name of Jesus, and I go to jail because you guys are so in fire for Jesus, and you're doing all these amazing things for Jesus, literally the judge looks at me and goes, I can't control the movement. You're free. You're free. I don't know how to end this. Let's stand up. Let's pray. If you're a first-time guest, some of our team that's going to be leading the Lord's Supper, y'all come up here. As you come up here, I'm going to explain before we go into song, Robert, so just hang up. But let me just pray for us as we respond right now, because we're about to baptize some people. We're about to have some fun. Let me just pray for us. Lord Jesus, we love you. Kind of mad I wore a sweater today. I'm sweating bullets. Jesus, we just ask for a movement to launch. May we be faithful to proclaim your name. May people give their lives to you. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.